This episode features young women who, through courage and determination, are beating obstacles in their way to furthering their studies. Losing one's sight can be a devastating experience, but three remarkable women in Cape Town show how they've adapted and are leading fulfilling lives. To tell me if my lips are fine. I shouldn't even I'm the youngest of five children. Um, I grew up with my, both of my parents. When I was in matric, I lost my mom. And without her, I was thinking that I wouldn't be capable of doing my matric year, but with the strength and everything, and the support and the help of God, I've been through everything. And of course, before I became blind, I used to go to the beach, hang out with my friends, having fun. I am an only child. My mother died when I was eight. Um, I was raised by my grandmother and my aunts. I was a normal child. I didn't really like playing outside with other kids. I liked, I enjoyed watching TV and listening to the radio. And I went to school. I was a very carefree, um, energetic uh, teenage girl, um, very, um, you know, just very ambitious and, and full of life. Um, and of course, um, you know, just as any teenager would be um, interested in, in sports, in socializing with my friends and just, you know, having fun and pursuing my, my career at high school. I had headaches and I went to the doctor. After a couple of visits to the doctor, um, the headaches went away and then I woke up one day with a stiff neck. I started deteriorating. I was in bed and I couldn't move. Um, so I was admitted to hospital and I was at the hospital for about six weeks and I was diagnosed with a syndrome which left me blind. I was wondering if I would have to spend my whole life depending on people. I would say I felt sorry for myself. Um, I just, I didn't have hope for life. I thought um, my life was over. Now, how's this one? What color is this? It's Can I gray. feel like Is it gray? gray? I like this one. Yeah. I really like this it's one. It's a really nice one. When I woke up one morning, I was very ill. My mom had to rush me into hospital. I went for tests again, and they saw that there's a brain tumor. I've been through four operations to remove the tumor and the risks of the operation was very high. I couldn't lift it or couldn't walk, couldn't talk. When I woke up the day after the operation, I was left blind. I was thinking that my life is just gonna be like being um, depending on somebody. And you almost don't want me. <laughs> 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 At the age of 17, while in grade 11, I was diagnosed to have glaucoma and retinal detachments. And while at school, um, writing a second last paper for my examination, everything went to blur in front of me. And I was then um, taken up in hospital where they'd done some further testing to find that the pressure in my eye was so high that it caused damage to my optic nerve and ruptured my retinas. So um, I had to undergo several operations that were all unsuccessful and led me to be totally blind. Initially, when you are blind, you often grapple with the thought of how am I going to be independent again and how am I going to fit back into society? How am I going to be able to pursue a career? Am I going to study further? Am I going to be able to have a family? Those were all the thoughts that I grappled with at, at the age of 17. 
I often thought about what type of career will I have one day? Would somebody ever love me in the sense that, you know, me being blind and, um, you know, would want to start a family with me? So I think, you know, when, when you're faced with those kinds of questions, um, it's then when an organization like LOFOB steps in and help you realize that achieving those things are not impossible. I gained my confidence. I learned how to be around people, how to be in you know, a professional space, in a working space, how to be independent. I feel normal. I feel that I could have a normal life and have a, you know, a career. My definition of a successful, successful blind person isn't only just about climbing a ladder in the corporate world. It's about being um, adjusted to your blindness. I think that's very important. So the steps to becoming adjusted to your blindness, is, is, it's, a, it's a huge one. And it really, it, it really takes a lot out of an individual. It takes a lot of courage and determination. Today I'm going to introduce you to the cane. What we're going to use today is what we call a folding cane. So we're going to take off the elastic. Stunning stuff. You're just going to open it up, let it fall, keep your hand on the elastic. Okay, let's just let it fall. So here we go. And then you can tap, 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 and then it's fixed. Hand is in the center of your body. This hand must be away from the body. It's important that your arm is relaxed, okay? The more relaxed you are, the more control you have over the cane, okay? Your index finger is going to be extended along the cane. Your thumb comes around the cane, and your cane is resting on this middle finger, okay? Your cane is resting on the middle finger. These two fingers can relax. Okay, now we're going to swing the cane. All right. How we're going to swing is we're going to use our wrist. Okay. You're only using the wrist. Swing. Swing more to the right. There we go. Yeah, so when we walk, it's always opposite sides, okay. keeping in step. No? Mm -hmm. Tip is on the left, right foot in front. There we go. So when the cane moves over to the left, to the right, sorry, your left foot must be in front, okay? So the, when you swing your cane, at the same time you have to move your leg. So it's not the cane first and then the leg, okay. they must move together. Okay. Hand away from the body, here we go, here we go. That's easy. Come to me, here we go, here we go. And away from the body, using our wrists. Excellent. If you keep left, you know you're fine. You're making your way to where you want to be. There we go. We keep shorelining on our right-hand side, keeping in touch with the wall. Here we go. My typical thing is traveling alone. Although I can walk with a long cane, I won't um, travel alone because I'm not familiar with the area and um, I'm very fearful of traveling alone. I wouldn't mind traveling on my own, but when I get to a place, it's the whole safety, whether will I be robbed? Am I, you know, is this area safe for me? When I was sighted, I, I enjoyed, like, reading magazines. That's something I can't do anymore. Like if I'm in a place like a health facility, there's a magazine lying on the table, I can't read that magazine. Or at home, there's a magazine and I, I'm really interested in what's going on. I heard someone saying, okay, so-and-so is on the cover. And I'm interested in, you know, knowing about that person, but I can't read, you know, because I can't see and I have to wait for someone to be in the mood, you know, to page through a magazine and tell me what's going on. Those are my difficulties. When are you going to get your... In my case, it really is a case of love is blind because my husband and I met um, when I was totally blind. So we were dating for three years. We married this year for 18 years and I've never seen him. 
all I got to experience is how I felt when I met him and the way he made me feel when we were together. And when we do things, I'm included in everything and, and that makes me feel, you know, warm towards him knowing that, you know, I'm just a person before I'm a person with a disability. We were one year married and we decided to then start a family. Initially when I found out I was pregnant, we were thrilled and over the moon. And of course, you know, after the initial excitement died down, I was of course now facing my realities of what am I going to do if, you know, it turns out that my daughter is diagnosed with the same eye condition. At seven months, we had to have an emergency seizure and she was born and fortunately everything turned out well and she, she was a healthy little baby, she was just underweight and today a beautiful 15 year old girl. So people like your, yes, your CEO, your managing director and executive director, they are what we would term top, top management because they are right on top of all the other managers, okay? I go shopping whenever I can, I like, I like shopping, I like window shopping. <laughs> I go into a shop and I start picking clothes. The person that I'm with who's sighted will tell me, okay, this looks, I, this, I'll, I'll, I'll say like, okay, I'm looking for a dress. We'll go to the dress section and we'll start, I'll start feeling dresses. She'll describe the dress and I'll feel it. I'll say, no, I don't like it, I like it. And then we'll take it and then we'll go try it on. But like here, and I'll do that for hours. And I, you know, I listen to music, um, to the radio, I read sometimes. Um, yeah, and I hang with friends. Um, a bit of piano lessons. I like to be surrounding with children um, because I feel that they are making me much, much more happy. I love swimming. Um, I, love, I like singing, although I can't sing and what I do for fun. I hang out with friends, going to the beach, and um, socializing. Learn from the environment. We're a normal family. We enjoy going to the park. We enjoy doing things like ice skating and playing tent and bowling, and we'll go hiking, and we'll do anything that, you know, we like to do as a family. And we always do things together, and, you know, there's no about, you know, Dad and I will do this, and, you know, sorry, you have to sit out because you can't see. Everything that we do, we do together as a family, and we just enjoy life together. And I think that's the most important thing, learning to adapt to circumstances so that we can enjoy what we like together. I'd like to study further. Um, I want to go along the lines of communications or media. The things what I look forward to is um, to have my job, to earn money, and to make an impact on somebody else's life, to encourage people someday. Despite suffering insults, prejudice, and threats, a few young women in Durban refused to be denied their right to education. Well, a lifestyle is a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of the aim is to beat them all. I'm a student, um, I'm 21, I'm from Nigeria, and my life back home was a very interesting one. I left home 2013. I actually came here to study and I actually studied at Apollo Technical College in Pretoria. I did my N4 certificate in public administration. I came to study, basically just to study in South Africa and from there maybe travel to go look for a job or further my education. I'm 27 years old. I'm from Zimbabwe. I am an academic at heart. I love studying, I love research, and currently I'm doing my master's in journalism at DUT. I got in on the presidential scholarship, so that's how I came to South Africa. It was the one country I'd said in my heart, I'll never go to South Africa. 
The way people talk about Zimbabwe, saying they see it in the media, is the way I saw South Africa in the media. And I thought if I get here, the first thing, there'll be a gun to my head, I'll get raped or, or get robbed. That's all I, that's the picture I had about South Africa. She's always indoors, because uh, her dad is a Zimbabwean, and so everyone in the neighborhood, they know, and they tease her about that. So she don't go around to, uh, to neighbors. She had friends when she was a toddler. Then as she was growing up, then all of a sudden, they just vanished. They, they said, Ay, this, this is a query, query. We, we cannot miss, we cannot be seen with her. We cannot mix with her. Because query, queries, they're stinking, and they come to the country to take the jobs. They're full of scams, all those sorts of nonsense. <laughs> she just wants to finish her matric and go to university and, and start her life somewhere else. She, she really doesn't like the place because she gets insulted every way. Do you know, when you leave your country, you see that it's not like they said it would be. So getting to the airport, the guy collected the money I was giving and my friend because we came together. He collected $600 from us. You don't know that these people don't have good intention. You always think that everybody have a good intention for you. We've been crying from the airport from home together that, you know, this guy took $600 from us. What are we going to tell our parents back home? Yes. Leaving home, the first month was crazy. You know, when I met, it was a disaster. It was something that I would wake up in the morning, I would cry. I would literally cry. And there was no daddy to hug. There was no mommy to hug. So then I and my friend just looked at it like, okay, I think reality has set in. It was really hard, because I felt like maybe Lagos is just behind me. I wanted to go back home immediately. Even yesterday, I wanted to go back home, but I just can't. It's like 24 hours sitting in the bus from Harare to Joburg, then from Joburg to Durban. My first experience in South Africa was at Joburg station. I got by the bus station, took out my, uh, my bags from the, from the boot, which were so many. And then this guy just came, picked up my bags and started walking. And I'm like, leave my bags. And there was a security guard standing nearby and he just kept standing. So the guy left my bags on the floor and is like, 50 rand, no fighting. That was my first experience. And I gave him the 50 rand because I was looking at the guard that maybe he's going to do something. I'm used to that kind of environment where people are looking out for each other and that didn't happen so I paid the guy and he went. In the morning, I woke up literally in a new world. I can't speak the language, I don't understand anyone, and I'm supposed to communicate. Until we found a taxi and came to DUT. And when we got there, we couldn't ask questions, mainly because we were a bit timid after the experience at the bus station. We were afraid to talk to people, because even the taxi driver was very rude, because we could not communicate with them effectively. My problems are Kimberly, Akale Eseka, grade 11. The teacher who really offended her, he low teacher low way mufun de sayi chograph. Ati ofunam sebenzo ake was called. Ngati abani ngabanta ba wins ilenden. Kimberly na he was away and um sebenzo awo. Ati low teacher low na ati. Eh when angani se Zimbabwe in front of 70 something children yeah we as a class in ukuthi kukanja once uthisha washo something then you say we yona gama lakho lelo ikimbali 
that's when I feel as very small. Means I feel like that way. If man abe was in Zimbabwe, then I I see a human being. Then you say something else, um, alien. Every time people hear Nigerians, it becomes an issue for them. It became a thing that we were isolated in class. We were just always on our own. Nobody wanted to be friends with us because they perceived us, you know, foreigners and everything. When I look about the challenges and everything that I faced, I feel like I just want to be my, by myself at home. I just want to be inside because I don't feel safe walking on the streets because any person can just come to me and rob me, which I have been a victim of. And the person walking beside me didn't even come to my aid, just crossed the road. It's very terrible because when you go out, they just have, oh, you don't speak Zulu, so what am I supposed to do? And I'm really trying to understand the language. And they will just say, oh, no, you know what, just shut up. In class, just shut up. Being a person who'd grown up in, a, in an environment where all my teachers were, were black and were of the same descent as me with the same language traits and accent, I found it hard to learn. I would sit in front in class and I would be very quiet during the lectures. Everybody thought I was a very quiet person, yet I could not hear anything. So after the lecture, I would just take down whatever topics they wrote on the board, then I will go to the library. So I started, uh, you know, putting up my hand, answering questions. I started getting bullied because of that. They didn't know what I was going through. They didn't know that uh, for me to sit in front, it's not like I don't like to relate to other people, but it's because I could hardly find my footing in a new setting where I'm supposed to pass because the terms of my scholarship, if you fail, you be go back home. That day, I think I let her complain. So I say, I'm not happy. I'm going to end up in school. Why find the principal? Why stamp her? Why sign her? Or go to we born in London. Why we born? Go to she's guilty. After I say apologize, I the Lotisha. I was about to be absent. I song is cutting my school in. I put my school in. I shall my school in. And I want to be a stand and a life. I took full of bulala. But you are overcome a local cause. I shall not that's a, a life sometimes in jail. The moment we hear xenophobia, we panic. At that moment, it's like I'm about to die. Because imagine me being here and people enter and start killing people. We didn't come here because we want to come and arm anybody. But we came here because we want to come and study. And we studying years, we are helping young girls, like we are also empowering ourselves. Uklongu bona ubona nje la banta banga panje beshugu nyezwa. Iyonte pshungu nje le. 